you worship him. Ooh, there's something about when you just call out to the Lord and just praise him and just forget about everything out there on the outside and just shut it off and just come in and try your best to close down the flesh and let the spirit man arise and connect with our holy God. That's when you just feel that connection there. That There's nothing like it, folks. There's nothing like it on the earth. I tell you what. Woo. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Today I want to talk to you about magnificent mothers. Amen. We got a lot of magnificent mothers in the house today. Amen. And the Bible is full of a lot of magnificent mothers. Amen. Father, we love you today. I thank you for the Word of God. I thank you for our mothers. I thank you, Lord, that uh, from the very first Mother Eve that you had a plan for life, you had a plan for family, you had a plan, God, to, to just institute what you're all about. I, I guess, Lord, that the closest thing we'll ever know to your love is through a mother. Uh, you've given them that built-in attribute there. And um, I just pray that the ones that are in here today, that you will show that same love that you have for us into their hearts today. There's a lot of mothers today, Lord, that are grieving. They're grieving because they miss their mother. But I know, God, you can feel that gap. You can feel that void in their life today, and you can let them know, God, that they are safe and sound in your arms. And one day, one day soon and very soon, when we come to see you, Lord, we will be reunited with all of our mothers that have went on to be before us. So thank you for the word, Lord. I pray for the anointing. I pray, God, it'll be your words that, that something will come out today that will help us, that will help instruct us, and not only help us instruct us, but also encourage us, God, that we can be what you called us to be. So I thank you in advance, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this is a special day. This is a special day that once a year here in America and probably all over the world, but we celebrate our mothers. Amen. It's a time where we show special honor, special love, special respect, special appreciation. Amen. For all of our mothers and what they mean to each of us. As I said earlier, if your mother's still alive, I, I, I encourage you today to find some time during the day. To make a call if she's not close, make a call and just tell her how much you appreciate her. If she is close, go by and visit her. Go by and give her a hug. Go by and share your appreciation for her for all the years that she has demonstrated her love and care for you. Amen? Now let's face it, folks. Mothers do and have done for us a whole lot. And if we were to ever write it down, there would be no way we could keep up everything and write down everything a mother has done for us in our life. You can try, but there's just not enough pieces of paper and not enough pens to write it down with. Amen? There's no possible way. Can I hear an amen on that? Amen. But perhaps one of the mother's greatest contributions is the way they instruct our lives. And this is a little humorous, but it's the truth. And I want to share this with you first. What, does mo what did mothers and what do mothers teach us? Well, mothers teach us about foresight. Amen. They say, make sure you wear clean underwear because you never know when you're going to be in an accident. <laughs> now, how many of you has heard that growing up? I have more than once, and I'm always thinking, well, if I'm in an accident, it ain't going to really matter, is it? <laughs> but, you know, but uh, mothers also teach us about logic. If you fall out of that tree and break your neck, don't come crying to me. I mean, have we heard that before? How about this? Mothers teach us about maturity. Eat all your vegetables so you, can never, uh, so you can grow up strong. If you don't eat your vegetables, you'll never grow. I mean, these are some things. And then I even heard this one growing up. Make sure you eat everything on your plate because there's kids all around the world don't have nothing to eat. How many of you have heard that one? Amen. How about this? Mothers even teach us about religion. You better pray that that stain comes out of the carpet. <laughs> Amen. How about this one? Mothers teach us about time travel. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into next week. <laughs> Have you ever had that happen? I, I mean, I can relate to all of these, folks. <laughs> Amen. But I'm still alive, so praise the Lord. 
Amen. Uh, mothers even teach us about genetics. You're just like your daddy. You ever heard that said to you? Now, you can take that either way. Mothers even teach us about weather. It looks like a tornado ran through this room. You ever heard of that? And then one more. The mothers teach us about the circle of life. I brought you into this world, and I can take you out. <laughs> amen, amen. So, yeah, that's a little humorous and, and all that, amen. But uh, one thing I want to share, all jokes aside, I want to make a statement to you, and I believe it's a statement that to be true. Mothers are perhaps the most powerful, influential force on the face of the earth. Can you say amen? Amen. Now, we are living in difficult times in America right now. And the problem in America is that we are like a ship out there without a rudder. We're like a ship out there without a compass, and it's lost at sea. Amen. We're in a dark, stormy night headed for destruction. Amen. And the anchor of the house is gone in many cases. And what is that anchor? What holds the home together? It's motherhood. Did you know that? Motherhood holds a house together. And there's a war against motherhood. There's even a war right now against even calling the mother a mother. The woke generation out there is saying, no, no, that's offensive. Let's call them a birthing person. I mean, isn't that sad? Taking away the title of mother. Amen. That's what we're living in nowadays. And the result of that is immorality. Adultery, fornication, homosexuality, militant feminism, and juvenile delinquency. All of this can be traced back to a home that comes from the neglect of motherhood, whether you believe it or not. It is true that the father is the head of the household, but it is just as true that the heart of the home is the mother. Amen. Amen. And the Bible gives us great examples of mothers that and their difference they made and the influence they made. Let me read just a few to you here this morning. The first mother on this earth was named Eve. Amen. Her name literally means living. Amen. And she was the first to bear children, Cain, Abel, and Seth. But she was also the first mother to lose a child. Amen. When Cain killed Abel. But it was also through Eve's son Seth that all the people began to call on the name of the Lord. Amen. That's exciting. The Bible gives us some wonderful examples of mothers that made a difference. First, there was Jochebed, which was the mother of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Amen. And you know the story. She was the protective mother. She was the mother that Pharaoh had set out a decree to kill all boys, all male childs. Any male child was to be killed and thrown into the river. Amen. But Jochebed, Moses' mother, seen something special in Moses, and she hid him for three months. And then when she placed him over in the, by the big uh, uh, leaves and trees, in a, in a sense for God to direct Pharaoh's uh, daughter to find and raise him up as her own. Amen. And then we see Eunice is another mother, which was Timothy's mother in the New Testament. She was an instructive mother. Amen. In 2 Timothy 1 there. Timothy's name actually means honored by God. Honored by God. And he was an evangelist who traveled with the Apostle Paul. And he was known for his sincere faith which taught by his mother Eunice and even his grandmother Lois. So these are very important mothers, an instructive mother. And then there was another mother that we all probably know well, which was the loyal mother, the mother of Jesus, Mary. She was a mother that was so loyal that even when the disciples left and denied that they even knew the Lord, even when he was on the way to the cross and being beaten and spit upon and slapped and cursed and all the ridicule that Jesus took on the way to the cross, this loyal mother Mary never left his side. She was there when he was crucified. She was there when they took him off the cross. Mary would stayed loyal no matter what had happened to her son. Amen. So today, amen, amen. Today, if I want to talk about another mother here in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Amen. And this mother is a wonderful mother, and her name is Hannah. If your name is Anne, Annie, or Anna, it came from this lady 
by the name of Hannah. Amen, amen. Her name actually means gracious, gracious. Hannah was a gracious lady, but she didn't have it easy, folks. She lived at a time when polygamy was tolerated. Her husband had two wives, amen. And the sad thing about it is uh, her husband's other wife was able to bear children. She had a few sons and a few daughters, and it made kind of Hannah a little, um, I guess you could say, sad and not realizing what is going on. Maybe like she didn't uh, equal uh, level up to the same as the other wife because she was barren, the Scripture says. It says she could not have children, and, and no matter how they tried, she could not bear a child. And, and uh, she wanted a child so bad, but yet she couldn't bear one. And no doubt, I mean, you know, we know human nature. You know, we live in it today. No doubt other wives mocked her and probably put her down because she was barren. Something's wrong with you. God's probably punishing you because you can't bear children. You know, people can be cruel at times. But Hannah's heart cried out to the Lord that she might have a baby boy. You see, Hannah wanted a baby that she could raise up and, and, and give unto the Lord to serve the Lord. Amen. I believe Hannah is a picture for all of us today of a magnificent mother. Amen. If you're a mother today or you want to be a mother one day, amen, I want to give you five principles today from God's Word that I pray that these principles will be written upon your heart. And you may be thinking, but Pastor, I'm not a mother. Pastor, I'm not even a woman. I'm a man. Well, that's okay. That's okay. That's all right. Because these principles apply to also men too. But today I want to focus mainly on the mothers. Amen. And I believe these principles here that I want to share with you today give us some great guidelines of how to raise our children. Amen. In this generation. The first is this right here. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 10. I gave you a little story heading up to this that she was barren, that she always wanted children, but she couldn't or other, the other wife did and all. And yet she in verse 10 says that she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she bowed a bow, said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, I will give unto thee thine handmaid a man-child, and I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Amen. Think about that. Now, Nazarites back then, they, the men didn't cut their hair. It was kind of a, the tra- tradition of that uh, movement at that time that if you're a Nazarite, uh, no razor would come up on your head. Uh, even uh, Samson was a Nazarite. And you know what happened when the razor got on his head. Amen. He lost his strength and all of that. So it was a thing set in order by the word of the Lord. Hannah's desire in their heart was to have a male child. I want to have a son. And I want to, I just want this, I have this instinct, Lord, to have this child. And I want this, I want to give it back to you, God. Hannah knew what the Bible said in Psalms 127.3. Look what the scripture says. Lo, children are a heritage unto the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Did you know that children are a gift from God? They're a gift from God. Amen. Amen. You need to take them as a gift. Amen. Children are a blessing, not a burden, not a burden, but a blessing from God. And there's something terribly wrong, folks, in this generation, especially that we live in nowadays, when children are looked at as a burden instead of a blessing. Like, oh, you've messed my lifestyle up. You've, you, you, you've changed some things that I, that I thought I had in order. It's no more a blessing, it's a burden. Even so, there is, <laughs> even though it's sad to say, but even though it's tragically something wrong when children are being put to death and aborted just because it interferes with your life. That's sad, folks. That's very sad in today's society we live in. And my heart goes out. It really does. It goes out to the women out there who want to have children and can't for whatever reason. My prayer is for you. God knows your heart. He knows you would love to have children. But those that can and have and and will not because of this world's goods, because they feel like their freedom's more important uh, and owning their own things and having their own stuff is more important than having a blessing from God. Let me tell you something. If you're one of those, I hope you're not. 
but if you're one of them, you're missing a big blessing. You're missing a big blessing that only the Lord can give you. But pastor, I have children, and I might have to quit my job if I have children. I might have to sell my sports car because it's only got two seats. I may have to buy a minivan instead. Uh, I may have to probably won't ever be able to go on vacation again because, you know, the more children you have, the more money it costs. And, you know, I, you know, I'm just not ready for that. I won't be able to save no money or anything. Hmm. Oh, I'll tell you what, folks. If you've got that mindset, you're missing the whole picture here this morning because if we've had children, uh -uh, a lot of people say they'll make us poor. No, that's not the truth. Amen. As a matter of fact, children don't make rich people poor. They make poor people rich. Amen. You may not have money in the bank. You may not have a lot of stuff. But if you've got a healthy child and you love that child and they love you back, you've got the greatest blessing there is that God can give you. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. <laughs> Children are a blessing. What made Hannah such a great woman was that she had first a priority. Number one, she had a priority. She did not think it to be less than the best to be a mother. That priority was of her heart. Amen. Lord, Lord, give me a man child and I can give him back to you. The priority was I won't take all this on as self, but if you'll just do this, I'll give him back. A priority is for him to serve the Lord. Amen. Having the right priority, ladies, this morning is what makes you a magnificent mother. And not how much you give to your kids, but putting the priorities in order. Amen. There's a lot of priorities that are out of order nowadays. Amen. Look at First uh, Samuel 1.10 again. And she was bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. The number two principle is the principle of prayer. How many of you pray for your children? Do you ever let up? It don't matter how old they are. Do you just, when they get to a certain age and you let up? No. Don't ever quit praying for your children. I don't care if your children is 65, 70 year old and you're still alive. Pray for your children. They're still your children. Because see, when you get your priorities lined up, then your prayers line up behind the priorities. See how all this kind of goes together? God knows what he's doing. Amen. When, you, when do you start raising your children? When they're born? Uh -uh. When do you start praying for your children? When they're born? No. When they're conceived, you start praying before they're conceived. You say, Lord God, I want to have a child. Lord God, I want a, I want a, I want a child that I, can, that I can bless and that it will bless you back. Lord, I want to have a family. So I start praying now, God, for you to work with, the, with me on this. The priority gets in order. The prayer gets in order. You need to pray for your children before you even have the children. I know of some ladies I've heard of, they sing while they're pregnant. They sing to their baby. They rub the belly and they say, oh, Lord God, thank you, Lord, for this child that you're going to bless them with. I just praise you, Lord. And they can, I've heard mothers even say this, that while they sing praises to the Lord and really just thank God for that blessing that's fixing to come, they can feel that baby kick. They can feel that baby kick. And we know that's true because Elizabeth with John the Baptist, you remember that? When she found out that her cousin, Mary, was having a child, the baby leaped in her womb. And the scripture says that that child was filled with the Holy Ghost in the womb. Hey, Amen. That's pretty good stuff right there, isn't it? And, and she felt the joy of the Lord. So when do you start praying? When's the principle of prayer take place as a mother? Before that child is even born. Right when you feel that God is going to give you that child, he is an answer to prayer. And here's Hannah, and she's praying with all of her heart. And in verse 10, it says she wept sore. Have you ever prayed so hard for something that you've wept sore? Bitterness of soul, meaning she cried in agony. Oh, God, I want a child, not for me, not for my pride, but God, if you'll bless me with this, I promise, a vow, a vow to you, I will give him back to you to serve you. Now, that's a bitterness of soul, cry, and agony right there. Amen, amen. She never wanted it so bad than that day. Have you ever felt something and prayed for something so earnestly that there was bitterness of, 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 of soul into your spirit? Amen. That is a deep, sincere prayer. 
And I was looking in the Bible. <coughs> excuse me. I was looking at some of the women that were barren in the Bible, and God took these women that were barren, and he turned them around and made them special, and the children they had were special. He took these women, and, and in his grace and in his mercy, he, he took these children that changed the lives of many people, that changed the way the Bible was even written because of, of the plan God had. Let's look at some of them. Sarah, remember Sarah? Sarah was bur uh, barren until she was 90 years old. Now, I don't know about you ladies, but if I had not gotten pregnant or, had, uh, or, or even conceived up to that age, I'd probably, as a human being, just throw my hands up and say, well, it's just not meant for me. 90 years old. Now, of course, a lot of you in here are saying, no, that's uncalled for nowadays. You never hear of a 90-year-old coming up with a child. But in these days, these people live longer. I mean, they live six, seven, eight, nine hundred years in a lot of these cases. But the more sin that's entered this world and more uh, uh, elevated and all, we're just getting more, less and less and less of age. Now, if you live to be 100 years old, man, you've had a great life. But you would never hear of a 90-year-old woman nowadays having a child, maybe 50, 55 max, and that's a risk. But here's Sarah, 90 years old, but she met the Lord, and the Lord God blessed her, and she gave him a son, and his name was Isaac. Amen. And Isaac was one of the three patriarchs of the Israelites. You know, even with, even with Sarah, sometimes we get ahead of God, don't we? And we think, well, there's no way I can have a child. And here's uh, Abraham. He goes up and, and, and uh, he says to his wife, Sarah, you know, God's going to bless us with a son. He's going to become the seed of the, of the uh, Israelite uh, nation and all. And, and she can't get pregnant, so she's thinking, well, maybe you just need to take my handmaiden over there. And uh, he, uh, <laughs> Hagar, and he, he said, well, maybe you're right. And they took their eyes off of God, you know, the scripture and everything. But that wasn't God's plan. Even though he did have another child, that wasn't the one the blessing was coming through. The blessing was going to come through Sarah, Sarah's womb. Amen, and he and she did. God blessed her barrenness and helped her conceive to where it was Isaac, amen, which is the one that is to spread the seed, amen. Another in the scriptures, Rachel. Remember Rachel? She prayed and said, Lord, give me children lest I die. That's another bitterness of soul, like I've got to have children, God, lest I die. And God heard her prayer, and he gave her a son named Joseph. Remember that? And Joseph, the story, what a story behind Joseph, all from an answer of prayer. And then we hear a lady in the Bible by the name of Ruth. Ruth was another. She was barren. Did you know that? She wanted a child, and she found mercy from God, and God gave her a child, and his name was Obed. His name was Obed. And you're thinking, well, who is Obed? I've never heard of Obed. Well, Obed was the grandfather of King David. The grandfather of King David, all that come from a lineage that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to come through. Amen. All an answer of prayer. And then, as I said a while ago, another is Elizabeth. Elizabeth did not have a child, and she prayed and asked God for a child, and God answered her prayer and gave her a little boy by the name of John that we know as John the Baptist. Amen. Amen. The forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture says in Matthew 11, 11, check this out. Among them that are born of women, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. All because of answer to prayer. And then we come to Hannah right here in 1 Samuel. Who prayed and said, Lord, give me a son. Give me a son. And God gave her a son. And she named him Samuel, the greatest man in the Old Testament between Moses and King David. Amen. All because she prayed and all because she said, I want a man child. I want a son that I can give back to you, Lord. Wouldn't you agree that we need more praying mothers like that? Wouldn't you agree that we need more mothers in this world we live in that would bear children as a result of an answered prayer and that would say, hey, I want to dedicate them, Lord, back to you? I believe we would. What would the world be like without Isaac? without Joseph, 
Amen. Without Moses, without Obed, without King David, without John the Baptist, without Samuel. What would this world have structured around without these? And I wonder, I just wonder, you've got to wonder this. I just wonder, we've always prayed, oh God, please find a cure for cancer. Lord, cancer has taken so many lives away so early. Lord, find us a cure for cancer. And I just wonder, amen, that we don't know, but maybe God has already sent that answer, and we aborted that child somewhere down the road. I don't know that. Maybe God did. But you've got 65 million children that have been aborted. Who knows if God didn't send one of those that would have the answer and the cure to the cancer disease that we experience today. That's just a food for thought there. Amen. But raising godly children happens before they're born, all through the principle of prayer. Then we come to the third principle, the principle of purpose. Not only is the priority in order, not only is the prayer behind the priority, but now there's a purpose behind it. What is that purpose? Your priority's got to be in order. Your prayer determines your purpose. What was her purpose? Look at verse 11 again. She bowed a vow and said, Lord God of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget my, my, thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then here's what I'll do, Lord. Here's what she's saying. I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall be no razor come upon his head. <clears throat> Hannah was going to give back Samuel to the Lord for God honoring that purpose. For a God-honoring purpose. What is the principle? If the child is a gift from God, if the child has come from God, then the child should be given back to God for his purpose. Now, that don't mean you don't get to have fun. That don't mean you don't have to raise a child. That don't mean you can't have fellowship and companionship with the child. But the purpose behind it should be to serve the Lord, to serve God, that's to honor God and give him the blessing that he deserves. Our desire for our children should be that they walk with God, that their soul gets saved, that they live an upright life, not that they become some big sports hero. Oh, I just wish uh, my child would make it big in the NBA. I just wish, man, maybe he'll get a scholarship and, and move into the pro football one day. Uh, uh, no, that should not be the purpose you want for your children. It's fine if that happens and they got talent for that, but the principle of their purpose should be that they serve the Lord, that they serve the Lord. And it's sad, and I'm not judging by no means behind this pulpit today, but it's sad when the purpose of many people is to be at a soccer field on Sunday morning with 2,000 of their children and, and neglecting the house of God that, that, that has given them an opportunity to have everlasting life here. Now, I'm not judging. I'm just saying there's something wrong. The priorities are off. The purposes of all are off. The prayers are off. Amen. Amen. Our prayers for our children need to be God-honoring purposes. What prayers are you praying for your children? Are you praying for their health? That's good. Are you praying for their success? That's good, too. Are you praying for their well-being? Those are great. They're all great. There's nothing wrong with those. But how many of us in here, mothers, how many mothers listening on live stream today are praying that God would give your child a, an ability to bring him glory? That he could, they could step back. That's why I respect and really appreciate the McGregor family. Because their family, their mother, their father had a purpose, a desire, a priority. Amen. To give their children back to the work of the Lord. They raised them in that sense and as Pastor Roy has shared before, all the, all the brothers are in the ministry. They're either pastoring churches, evangelists, preaching, teaching. They're, they're all involved. Even the, the, their sister serving God, loving God with all her heart, giving ministry to the Lord. Amen. That's a, 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 the reason behind that was there was prayer. There was a priority, and there was a purpose, and it was God. You bless us with these children, we'll give them back into your work. And God's honoring that. Now, if you're a McGregor in here today, you can say amen to that because God has honoring that ministry today. Amen, amen. You want to know how to pray for your children? I'm going to give you a little example here, and it's found in the book of Ephesians. 
The book of Ephesians gives us a wonderful example of how you are to pray for your children. Look at verse uh, chapter 3 of Ephesians, starting at verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees to the, unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of who the whole family of heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with his might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, and the depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth all knowledge, that ye might be filled with all fullness of God. Look at verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. There's your, there's your ingredients. There's your purpose for your children, that they would know him, that they would dwell in him, that they would know the love of Christ, that they would be filled with the fullness of God. That's where you need to focus your uh, attention on your children. James even says it like this, chapter 4, verse 3. You ask and you receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your own lust. So many times we pray things, and we don't receive those things because we're asking it in a sense that we may obtain something on our own lust. Jesus is saying, when you ask for something, ask not my will, but thine will be done, Lord. What would you have my children to do? What would you have my children to be? How can I as a mother, amen, fathers, we'll talk to you next month, but how can you uh, as mothers, what can I do to raise up my child that would honor you and help my child to not only respect and honor their mother and father, but to honor and respect you. What can you teach me through that? You see, Hannah's prayer was answered because of its purpose. Lord, my purpose is to give him back to you. I'm not asking it up on my own will or on my own lust, but Lord, to give him back to you. Now, you can't make your child serve God. I don't care if you raise him up the best and he's in church every time the doors are open and you're Bible studying them every day and you're praying. You can't make him serve God. Amen. But you can desire for your children to serve the Lord, but we need to set goals for our children and be that example for them to follow. Amen. i tell you what, folks. A lot of children nowadays that are growing up and acting like they're acting and going off the rails and acting the fool and shooting up schools and and going in and cursing out teachers and slapping teachers and all i'm just using some examples it all results back somewhere down the road of what they have been around what they see in the house the examples that's being said what's been watched on tv the language that's coming out of their parents mouth uh, uh it's got to be i mean because i know that when, when we said a bad word or we said something that was negative, our mother took, took, took discipline to that. She didn't just say, don't say that no more. I'll tell you what, how many of you, uh, I've heard of some people that said they say a bad word and they get a backhand across their face. I mean, you know, it wasn't to abuse a child. It was respect that we are not going to be like that in this house. We are going to raise up a family, and I'm going to set that example of how I want you to live. Amen. What people are around is what they conform to. I, I, you can take it to the bank. I don't care if you're a grown human being right now and you get off the track somewhere and you get into a lifestyle that's wrong. It all ro ro roots and relates around to the people you started hanging around. Birds of a feather flock together. That's the old saying, and it's the truth. You need to be around positive people, amen, out there that will speak life into your life and not death and negative and, and defeat. So the first principle we've looked at to be a ma magnificent mother is we've got to get our priorities right, the principle of priority. And then we've got to move to the principle of prayer. We need to pray before they're conceived, while they're conceived, during the pregnancy, in all the days of their life. And then we move to the principle of purpose. There needs to be a purpose behind that. I'm going to give him back to you, Lord. I want him to serve you and to honor you. And then we come to that fourth principle, the principle of persistence. Be persistent. Amen. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 1 again, and let's look at verse 12 now. 
Verse 12 says, And it came to pass, as she, talking about Hannah, continued praying before the Lord, that Eli, he was the priest at the time, that Eli marked her mouth. Now, here's what he meant by marked her mouth. Like, he's, he's checking her out, he's watching her, he's looking what she's doing here. And now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunk, and he thought that, man, she's, she's been drinking or something. You know, she's acting different here. Amen. And verse 14, And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away that wine from you. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken there hereunto. And Eli the priest basically said this. He answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let not, let thine, not let thine, let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went, and then she went her way. She did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came into the house of Ramah. And Elkaniah knew Hannah. He made love to her. That's another word for that. He made love to Hannah. And the Lord remembered her. Therefore it came to pass when the time was come about Hannah had conceived, after Hannah had conceived, and she bare a son and she called him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Amen. Amen. She continued persistent in prayer before Samuel was even born and then after he was born. Did you know that Hannah was past 70 years old when she had Samuel? She was past 70 years old. Amen. And then in chapter 2, you can read that later when you get home, that she was even blessed with three, uh, three more sons and two more daughters. Not only did God give her a son, but the blessing behind her whole uh, principle to God that God said, I'm not only going to give you a child, but I'm going to bless you with even more, five more. Three more sons and two more uh, daughters. Amen. So what is the principle here? No matter how dark the days are, no matter how bad things look, no matter how far your child roams, don't ever give up on them. You hear me? Don't ever give up on them. Don't ever give up and throw them to the side no matter how difficult it is, no matter how impossible it is, you stay persistent. You pray for your children. You pray for your grandchildren. They may be running off the rail out there, but if they're still alive, God can still get them. He can still get them and bring them back. Amen. Pray. Keep on praying. Stay persistent. The Bible says we're told to wait upon the Lord, right? Oh, that's something Christians don't like. Uh-uh. Oh, no, 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 Lord. I prayed today. I want an answer this evening. And the Lord said, wait upon the Lord. Wait upon me. It's not your timing. God's timing. When everything comes right and everything, God's working on things. Don't look like he does sometimes. Don't look like he's even heard your prayer. But he's working on it. He's working on it. Amen. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up as wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Isn't that the scripture? Now what it says? Here's you another one. Psalms 37, 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Now, I don't know if you don't hear anything else that I say today. That needs to be a scripture we all learn. Wait upon the Lord. Amen. Patiently. Amen. And rest in him. Over and over, we're taught through the word of God to wait and trust upon the Lord. Because of Hannah's persistence, her sorrow was turned to gladness. You know, one scripture says there may be sorrow for the evening. But joy comes in the morning. Amen. You ladies that's had children, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, it hurts during that giving birth, don't it? Oh, man, you're in agony. That hurts. But boy, after that child is born, there's joy that comes back, isn't it? Same thing in our walk with God. Sometimes our prayer life, we need to pers be persistent. It feels like it's, it's, it's agony. But there's going to be joy in the morning. Just keep praying. Keep praying. Don't ever give up. Amen. Amen. Because of Hannah's persistence. Amen. That, 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 that sorrow and bitterness of soul was turned into gladness. Amen. She continued praying for a child, and God granted that and heard her prayer and named her baby boy Samuel. 
Amen. What do you think Samuel means? We just read it a while ago. It means ask of the Lord. That's what it translates to. Samuel asks of the Lord. Amen. Translated to that. Amen. If you want to see the persistence of Hannah's prayer, like I said, go to chapter 2 of 1 Samuel and read what God blessed her with after that. Now we come to the fifth and final one, the final principle of how to become a magnificent mother according to the Word of God. You get your priorities straight. You get them right. You get your prayer life right. You get your purpose right and your persistence right, and then your persuasion will follow. All these things in order, and then the persuasion as a magnificent mother will follow those other ingredients. Amen. Let's look at that for just a second here. 1 Samuel 21, uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 21 now. And the man Elkaniah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice in his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. And Elkaniah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. Tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord established his word. So the woman abode and gave her child suck, nursed him until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him with her and the three bullocks and an ephod of flour and a bottle of wine, and brought him into the house of the Lord in, in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and, the, and brought the child to Eli, the priest. And she said, O oh, my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood before thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me the petition that which I have asked him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he shall live, he shall be lent unto the Lord, and he worship the Lord there. Now that's very, very good because the persuasion, the persuasion to young Samuel that he is to also worship and honor the Lord. Amen. You see, Hannah saw the importance of persuading him while he was young. Even while he's just now weaned, she brought him into the house of the Lord. She put sacrifices before and said, I'm giving him back to you right now, God. I'm not waiting till he walks. I'm not waiting till he runs. I'm not waiting till he grows up a little. I'm bringing him in after I've weaned him and I'm laying him before you, Lord. And that's where I want to start, right from, right from infanthood. She knew the power of persuasion. Look at 1 Timothy. Let me turn back there. I mean, second. I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Through five, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, with that without ceasing I remember the, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers day and night, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be uh, filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfringed faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and then thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that also is in thee also. See the power of persuasion? Little Timothy Little Timothy that ran some with Paul in the ministry, raised up by Eunice, a God-fearing woman, and even the grandmother that instilled the word in him and the, and the way to live from Lois, his grandmother. All these things. See the power of persuasion here? Amen. A father has influence on a child, but the deepest impression is made by the mother. Think about it. Mothers, I'm honoring you here today because God has not only put you in a position to uh, raise up a child and to birth that child, but also to be an influence for that child, to be a persuasion for that child. Amen. Never, never underestimate the power of a mother. Never do it, folks. Amen. Don't ever let anyone ever tell you and make you think it's not important to be a godly example for your children. And I'll finish with a final note here as the worship team comes. Oh, the power of persuasion. Check this out. True story. If this don't wake you up, then you didn't hear anything I said. 
about persuasion. There's a boy. He had a mother. She was very dominating. She had no time or love for anyone but herself. She was married three different times, and on her second marriage, her husband left her because she was abusive to him, to the husband, and to the boy. The little boy, when he was a child, never experienced any love, any care or concern from his mother. No discipline, total neglect from his mother. Matter of fact, she told him as a young child, the mother said, don't you ever bother me at work. Don't you ever pester me. This boy was totally rejected. He had a high IQ, but he dropped out of school. He joined the Marines. He received a dishonorable discharge. He had no talent, no talent, no skills. He had no driver's license. He moved to a foreign country and he married a foreign woman, returned to the United States, and his marriage fell apart and was shaken. He had been a failure all of his life. The only talent he had was what he learned when he was in the military of how to shoot a gun. He knew how to shoot a gun very well. He learned that from the Marines. But on November the 22nd, 1963, he took that talent, that rifle, the only thing he felt he was good at, and he went up to a third-story building of a bookstore in Dallas, Texas, and he fired three shots that changed the course of a nation when he assassinated President John F. Kennedy. His name, Lee Harvey Oswald. You might not have known that, but let me tell you something. I wonder if it had been different if he had a mother that knew Jesus and a mother that took him to church and instilled in him the love of God. I wonder what would have happened if, as a child if she'd have took him in her heart and in her arms and showed that love and concern and desire to met his needs. I wonder if things would have been different if she would have said, Lee, you call mama anytime you need me. You'll never be an inconvenience to me. I'll always have time for you, son. I wonder if things would have been different if she'd have said, son, you're the most important thing in my life. I love you. You see, ladies and gentlemen, mothers, fathers, children need the ABCs in their life. And they need ABCs from their mother. A, they need acceptance. B, they need belonging. And C, they need confidence. As we stand, I want to thank all of the magnificent mothers here this morning. And maybe you've come short on some of these. That don't make you a bad person. What it is is God's just trying to help us how to be a better mother. Maybe you can pick up from here and, and prove some things. Maybe you already do these things. Praise the Lord. This is not to chastise you at all. This is just to show appreciation of mothers and what God sees as a magnificent mother role. So may God bless every one of you. And let me say one more time, happy Mother's Day to all you mothers. As we sing, altars are open. Maybe you need prayer for something unrelated. Altars are always open here at the church. So whatever you need for prayer, come on up here. If it's not, then I want you to just praise the Lord and thank God for your children. Thank God for blessing you to be a mother so you could be a blessing to some others. In Jesus' name. Welcome, Holy Spirit.